the throwing shoulder. As a shoulder surgeon assessing a patient with a disabled throwing shoulder, it's important to remember that we're not just looking at the glenohumeral joint. In fact, we need to look initially at at least the whole shoulder girdle. This includes the acromioclavicular joint, the sternoclavicular joint, and importantly, the scapulothoracic joint. In fact, we're not just looking at the shoulder girdle itself. We need to consider the kinetic chain. The overhead throw motion is developed and regulated through a sequential coordinating task specific kinetic chain of force development with a kinetic chain of sequential body positions and motions. This is essentially an integrated program for muscle activation to, temp to temporarily link multiple body segments into one functional segment. This provides a stable proximal base of distal arm mobility. What it's able to do, it maximises the force development in the large muscles of the core and transfers them through the shoulder to the hand. In doing this, interactive moments are produced at the joints that are greater than the energy that the joint itself can produce. Also, tor torque is produced to decrease the deceleration forces. It's important to remember, with regards to throwing injuries, that they are most frequently the result of a process that involves body segments that are proximal to the shoulder, then affect the shoulder anatomy itself. With regards to the biomechanics of throwing, this is something that we've learned most from the Americans, where baseball is a massive sport. Throwing is divided into six segments, the wind-up and stride, the early cocking and stride, late cocking, acceleration, deceleration and the follow-through. In the early cocking and stride, the body is positioned optimally to generate forces and powers required to achieve the highest velocity. If the body momentum falls forward prematurely, the kinetic chain will be disrupted and the grace force will then be required to propel the ball at top velocity. It ends when the leg reaches its maximum height in early cocking and ends when the foot hits the ground. This stride allows time for the trunk motion to occur this allows increased energy transfer to the upper extremity. During this, the pelvic rotates forwards and the trunk rotates. The shoulder gets into external rotation and the trunk arches forward. The gluteus maximus fires on the stance leg to provide the pelvic and trunk stability. In the late cocking phase, the pelvis reaches its maxim maximum rotation and the torso, its torso is still able to ret rotate further. Maximal internal rotation torque occurs just before the maximum external rotation of the shoulder. This increased external rotation allows greater time for the acceleration forces to act. At maximum external rotation, the subscapularis, pec major, and latissimus dorsi are eccentrically contracting to stabilise the glenohumeral joint. Upward rotation of the scapula to about 180 to 100 degrees prevents impingement of the shoulder. Acceleration phase, the trunk continues to, to rotate and tilt. This allows transfer of potential energy to the upper limb. The forward trunk tilt allows the arm to accelerate through a greater distance. This time, subscapularis, pec major, and the lats reach maximum activity and the violent internal rotation occurs. Serratus anterior protracts the scapula to maintain a stable base for the humerus. The deceleration phase is the most violent phase, which is re results in maximum joint loading. The posterior shoulder, including teres minor, infraspinatus and the posterior deltoid dissipate this force as the arm continues to internally rotate and AD duct. The trapezius, rhomboids and serratus anterior assist stabilising the scapula. The follow through phase is the least violent of phases. The body continues to move forward until the arm motion decreases and stops. It's unlikely to be a culprit for injury due to, due to the decreased joint loading and minimal forces. As a shoulder surgeon, when assessing a patient with a disabled throwing shoulder, it's important to remember that the primary pathology is often proximal to the shoulder, and it's important to assess the whole of the kinetic change. Structural clean human pathology should be considered in context to these symptoms. As a result, management should be undertaken as a multidisciplinary approach, including the physiotherapist, sports physician and surgeon. In fact, the surgeon should probably be the last person to see the patient. The surgeon should assess the whole of the shoulder girdle, and once again take the cleaner humeral pathology in context to the rest of the other more proximal pathologies. It is mandatory as a shoulder surgeon to assess scapular function. The most prob common problem is a scapular dyskinesis. This is alteration of the position or motion of the scapula during coupled scapular humeral movements. The most common type is a type 1, which is prominence of the inferior medial border. The shoulder may also have a sick scapula. In this the scapula is malpositioned, there is type 1 prominence, so the inferior medial border prominence, 
and his coracle of pain and malposition. As a shoulder surgeon, the most important thing to assess is how much of the scapulothoracic pathology is affecting the kidney humeral pathology. I like to use two tests to assess this. The first is the scapula assistance test. The surgeon stands behind the patient and during abduction and forward elevation, assistance is made manually by stabilising the scapula and rotating the inferior medial border superiorly. This simulates the forced couple activity of serratus anterior and lower trapezius. If there is an elimination or modification of the impingement symptoms, it indicates a positive test and shows that it certainly is a scapulothoracic component of the shoulder problem. And it is essential that this is corrected if there is going to be successful treatment to the glenar humeral pathology. The test I like to use is a scapular retraction test. In this, the examiner once again stands behind the patient on this occasion holds the medial board of the scapula down and stabilises the arm as it's abducted forward in elevation. Once again, elimination and modification of the impingement symptoms indicates a positive test. The scapular attraction test with resistance is essentially the same test whilst undertaking an empty can test. So a traditional empty can test is undertaken at the beginning to see whether there's any evidence of impingement pathology. This is then repeated whilst the medial board of the scapula is stabilised. Once again, elimination and modification of the pingent symptoms indicates a positive test. Having assessed the scapulothoracic function, it is important to assess glenar humeral function. Things that one is particularly interested about with regards to the throwing shoulder is the range of motion and the presence of GERD, stability and particularly labral pathology, and the rotator cuff, particularly focusing on partial thickness tears. GERD, glenar humeral internal rotation deficit, is important to assess. In the throwing shoulder, there is often an adaptive increase in external rotation. In the symptomatic shoulder, the relative decrease in internal rotation may be greater than the increase in external rotation. This may indicate a posterior inferior capsular contracture. The GERD test involves stabilising the patient's scapula on the couch and comparing the total arc of movement between both shoulders. A loss of more than 20 degrees side to side in the total arc gives a positive test. In the diagram on the right, assuming that we're looking at the right and left shoulder, although in the lower picture the arm has more external rotation than, on the, than in the top picture, you can see the internal rotation has decreased as well. So they've decreased exactly the same. So the total arc of range of motion is 180 degrees. In this picture, the symptomatic shoulder is the lower picture. Although external rotation has increased, internal rotation hasn't decreased as much. As a result, the total arc of range of motion is only 155 degrees on the symptomatic side compared to 180 on the normal side. This patient essentially has GERD. Treatment should be focused on the posterior inferior capsule and trying to stretch this out with a night, stretch, with a night stretching program. Slap tears are commonly associated with a disabled throwing shoulder. However, they are often poorly diagnosed, overdiagnosed, and misdiagnosed. And result, as, as a result, there are poor outcomes of both diagnosis and treatment. In precision of physical examination tests, diagnostic imaging, and arthroscopic evaluation are the sole determinants of diagnosis. The role of the labrum is not only an attachment site of the long head of biceps and deepening the socket as we tend to normally understand, but also has other roles. It's a deformable structure to maximise the contact pressure, lubricate and increase concavity compression as the arm comes up into abduction and external rotation. It can act as a pressure sensor to maximise proprioception. There's also this attachment site for other ligaments and muscles. Important factors to take into the history and examination of labral tears, the history of pain, on abduction and internal rotation, so in the cocking position. There's often a weakness in functional strength. The patients may describe with symptoms of internal derangement, such as clicking, puffing, catching and sliding. Patients will often have a dead arm sensation after throwing. Multiple tests have been described to examine labelled tears. These are often very sensitive, but have a poor specificity. And there is no one test that is diagnostic of a labelled tear. The results of these tests should be taken in context with history, other clinical findings and imaging.
Label tears are best assessed by an MRI scan, or better, an MRI arthrogram, particularly in the AVA position, so in abduction and external rotation. However, it's important to remember that there are multiple concomitant pathologies noted with label tears. One study showed over 70% of the patients had a concomitant pathology. This was most common a post-partial thickness cuff tear. It's important to remember that an MRI scan is a static estimation of a dynamic problem. Also, many studies have shown that MRI label pathology is present in asymptomatic thrower's shoulders. With regards to cuff tears and long head of biceps pathology, it's important to remember that these are common incidental pathological findings in athletes older than 30 years. The biceps label capsular complex should probably be considered as a single unit rather than the individual components. And it's important to remember that biceps label capsular pathology tends to migrate distally with increasing age, so most problems tend to migrate down the long head of biceps. With regards to surgery, this should really be considered as a last resort and should only be undertaken if extensive and appropriate rehabilitation has failed or has only been partially been successful. Surgery should really be considered by both the surgeon and as, a pa as the patient as a method to improve shoulder anatomy so that rehabilitation can then be undertaken successfully. The commonest type of label tear that is encountered is the type 2 tear. The principles of treating this are undertaking a full evaluation of the shoulder and also looking for a peel back. Cleaners should be prepared appropriately. Multiple anchors should be used so that there are at least two points of fixation. It's important at the end of the procedure to see that the peel back has been eliminated. It's also important to evaluate the biceps mobility and avoid tethering of the biceps. Having undertaken the repair, it's also too important to check what effect this may have on capture tension and also to check that there's no loss of external rotation. At the same time, it's also important to consider the concomitant pathology, which one may or may not want to address at that time. In conclusion, overhead throwing is a complex action regulated through the kinetic chain. High velocity throwing places extreme force on structures in and around the clean human joint. And it's important to remember that most throwing injuries result from a process that involves body segments proximal to the shoulder which then affects shoulder anatomy. Management of the disabled throwing shoulder requires a multidisciplinary team approach. Throwing injuries should be assessed in the context of their kinetic change. As a shoulder surgeon, it's mandatory to assess not only the clean humeral joint in the context of the shoulder girdle, but also with regards to scapular function. The majority of injuries can be successfully addressed by an adequate rehabilitation program and do not require surgery. Surgery for the throwing shoulder should only be used after extensive and appropriate rehabilitation has failed. If this rehabilitation has failed, surgery may be offered to attempt to salvage an athlete's career. Surgery should really be considered as a method to improve shoulder anatomy so that rehabilitation can be successfully undertaken. Success rates with surgery with regards to return to play quoted between 22 to 85%. Thank you.